Enigmatic North America, Legends, Oddities, and Controversial History, Chapter 1, Episode 1, Montana Megaliths and the Stone Nubs, Natural or Man-Made. In the remote mountains of Montana exist several interesting rock oddities that have recently gained quite the attention online. Debates as to whether these peculiar sites are natural or man-made have taken place on Twitter and YouTube. In this video, we're going to be discussing three of those sites that can be found deep in the woods of Montana and asking the opinion of a Montana geologist as to whether it's possible that these three structures are man-made. The first is the Tizer Dolmen, which features a large boulder sitting perfectly at rest on top of two very large split slabs. How did that get up there? is the first obvious question that comes to mind, and although a random act of nature is absolutely possible, at first glance, I couldn't help but think that it's almost too perfect for me to believe that this structure was natural. How could this have been done without human intervention? Dolmens are megalithic structures that can be found all over the world, especially in Western Europe. They usually consist of three or more upright stones that make contact with a capstone at the top. The Tizer Dolmen is technically not a dolmen for this reason, as it only makes contact at two points. In many ways, this makes the structure all the more impressive. As to whether or not this was man-made, many skeptics online have commented that this capstone was likely deposited by a receding glacier at the end of the last ice age. But after doing some research, I believe this can't be the answer. When I pulled up the different maps that show the maximum extent of the glacial mass from the last ice age, the border of that mass was much further north than this location. The Tizer Dolmen can be found in the mountains east of Jefferson City, about 20 miles south of the capital Helena. Every single Ice Age map that I could find shows this boundary much further to the north. I first heard about this site while watching one of my favorite YouTubers, Michael Collins of Wandering Wolf Productions. On one of Michael's videos, he walks through the site and he stumbles across three aligned nubs that are protruding from the rock. The average person might look at these and say, those are just natural rock features that have been carved out on the rock due to erosion, and that very well might be correct. The reason this has brought so much attention and excitement is due to the stone nub mystery that can be found at the megalithic sites all around the world. In Peru, Egypt, Asia, and the Middle East and Europe, you can find these protrusions on the rock surfaces that appear to have uniformity. It's almost as if they have some type of purpose, and speculation about as to what that purpose is has been taking place among ancient history enthusiasts online. Well, first, I, I knew the nubs were there from um, either pictures or Julie's videos, uh, um, Julie Ryder uh, with Montana Megalith. So she has a channel where she's been covering all this stuff for years. And and by all means, go, go check out all that content. I, I think that, um, you know, I, I've never done a deep dive into her channel. I, I have, um, I think we, we, I think we approach things differently in terms of um, what we think these places are and how we look at it. And I really wanted to come to those places with a fresh perspective. And also, um, you know, my, my, my opinion and my thoughts on these aren't quite as, you know, all in, I think. Um, and if you watch the two channels, I think you'll, you'll notice a difference. But she has been putting out content for quite a long time on these sites. And I, I would definitely recommend people to go watch all that. But I wanted to kind of to, to show up with fresh eyes. And I love doing that at, at most places that I go to. It's very interesting um, because they are, you know, they're, they're in this alignment. And there's a crack through two of them. So it's a little shifted, but they're basically on a straight line. And nubs are this interesting worldwide phenomenon of these ancient sites. They're almost as telling as anything else that you would these sites. And the reason for that is because of the, you know, the abundance of, of them around the world at every, basically every major megalithic site on every continent on the planet. They're this unique feature that seems to have this interesting way of every time some idea is formulated about their form or their function, um, why they exist and what their purpose is. It, it, the more that you research it, whatever your, your idea is, it's, it's like the more that you research them, they, they destroy that idea. Okay. So, you know, most commonly most people, you know, when they first encounter nubs initially think that they're kind of leveraging purpose or something for moving these stones. But then that's, you know, you start going down that path and looking at them. And then that, that idea is, is kind of 
you know, shot. Um, uh, when you start looking that they're not all placed in strategic spots for lifting that would be ideal or advantageous for lifting or moving stones. Um, they don't have any kind of uniformity in that regard. You know, I've, there's been ideas that have been floated around um, them being some kind of code or language within the structures. But then, you know, the, there's just not any type of, again, uniformity to them in order that, that, that can be quite figured out or understood in that regard. And then also they're, 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 they're in spots that, you know, don't really lend themselves to that hugely. There's been a lot of ideas about them being, um, parts like in South America where, um, stone looks poured where, um, you know, that they were able to liquefy and manipulate stone and pour stone, you know, in South America and places like Peru and these different sites, the stone does look poured. It does look like it's been manipulated in some way like that. And that these might be like the, 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 the poor points. And that when it was removed, you know, these are the leftover points, but again, then you'll find the nubs in places where clearly the stone is cut or hasn't been removed yet. So it's still maybe part of a quarry and a piece that hasn't been removed. So clearly that's not the case in these places. And there's evidence of machining and tool marks in those areas as well. Um, there's a research group that I'm a part of, and, and I definitely want to give these guys a shout out because as far as I know, there's nobody doing more work on nubs than these guys. Um, Andrew, Phil, um, Ziggy, and all the guys that are in the research group and my buddy, uh, few years ago rob invited me to be a part of these guys every day are breaking down ideas around this stuff um ideas based around nubs around the world in a way that that nobody else is putting that level of energy into and so i definitely want to make sure to give these guys a huge shout out and that people should if they're interested in this phenomenon that's where you're going to be able to get the most information about stuff like this and these ideas um there's there's a lot of good you know work being done and ideas going around but it, it it's it's um you know, I think the best things that the nubs do for us right now at this point is connect these sites around the world collectively. Um, uh, they show a, a, a commonality between all these sites around the world. And that's the uh, uh, that's hugely important. It's a major piece of evidence for anybody that's exploring the idea of a worldwide civilization at one point in the past. There are more interesting oddities out in the deep woods of Montana. This rock feature shows a capstone making contact with an upright boulder and a flat smaller rock, which I believe was facing north. Regretfully, I did not take my compass out to confirm the exact directions, but I've asked Michael Collins of Wandering Wolf Productions to try and calculate the exact degree it's facing the next time he goes out to this site. The site that's gathered the most attention and controversy is the Sage Wall. On Twitter, when I posted photos of the site, I received comments from both skeptics and proponents of the man-made megalith hypothesis. Many people remain neutral on the topic, showing curiosity and wonder without giving too much of an opinion. Proponents believe people were overthinking this and that the alignments, cuts, and perfect fits between the boulders made it obviously man-made. Skeptics argued that it's not uncommon for peculiar things to happen in nature and that there's most likely a natural explanation for this. When I first walked upon this massive structure, my imagination started to run wild. It was much larger than I had initially perceived from the photos I had seen from Michael Collins of Wandering Wolf Productions. What's up everybody? I'm at the Sage Wall in Montana. This is absolutely baffling. As I hiked up and down the wall, looking at the blocks that at first glance seemed to have almost been fit into place, I couldn't help but think of Saksewoman. Sacsayhuaman is a megalithic site in Peru, which is also a hotly debated topic as to how it was created. Some say that the Inca built it as recent as the 15th century. Others believe that an earlier culture created this in the 12th century. The other theory is that these far predate either of those dates, and that the large megaliths were already there and adopted by the Inca, who would use more rough building styles of stone and mortar around the different megalithic structures throughout Peru. As I searched the site in Montana, 
I decided to lean further into my imagination, and I started looking for any signs of nubs similar to the ones that could be found at the Tizer Dolmen or Peru. A few examples popped out that I will share here. The Sage Wall in Montana, you can see right here with this photo, I just have it compared to Saxe Oman in Peru. And you can see why people have some questions. You can see why Mike was so enthused. You can see why Bright Insight and Joe Rogan were so enthused. Look at this thing compared to some of the megaliths around the world, okay? Obviously there are differences, but at first glance you're like, okay, entertain my imagination because that does look very similar. But you had found something really curious here. Um, this blew my mind. I missed this. I really wish I could have seen this when I was there. So on the right is a picture I took in Karnak in Egypt, um, probably six months before I went out to the Sage Wall, somewhere around there. And then on the left is um, a picture of a what, what looks to be a very similar uh, carve out at sage wall and so when i was walking around the area you know i would found several other features that i was really interested in this when i walked up on it i think because i had just been to to egypt and then um had been working through a bit of the footage already and looking at it it just this just popped into my head now you can see that on the right the, the clear shape of the square cut carve out cut out that channel in the circle spot. And you have the exact same thing here. Now it's 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 a little harder to tell. I do have other pictures. Some of them are featured in my videos, but that groove right there is is a is a clear, clear as day groove. It's 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 harder to see um, in this picture, but that is a that is a straight through groove from the squared off area at top to a circular part down at the bottom. Now you're not getting the whole circle because we, what's also kind of hard to tell here is, is at the bottom where that circle shape is taking taking place there, um, part of the stone there at the edge is cracked off. So the end there is broken. These are, are some of the examples that I was talking about that are kind of um, the surrounding evidence in the area um, besides just the wall that really have inspired me to kind of continue you looking um, uh, at, at the area, um, um, and, and instead of you know firmly landing on any kind of decision of it being some natural formation. If this structure was man-made, then it would seem to be beyond ancient and one of the most paradigm-shattering finds in the history of archaeology. All kinds of questions would need to be raised. Was there a previous era of an advanced civilization that existed in North America that the archaeological record was unaware of? What construction methods would need to be utilized to create this wall made out of extremely large boulders of granite? Before I let my imagination run any further, I decided that it would be best to talk to a geologist and ask the opinion on whether or not the structures as well as the nubs could have been built by humans. If not, what kind of natural processes would have taken place to create these sites? I was not at all afraid of having my fun spoiled. I'm of the firm belief that regardless of whether these sites are natural or man-made, that we're not the first generation of humans to be mesmerized by their presence. I speculate that for thousands of years, anyone who would have stumbled upon these sites likely asked the same questions we are asking today. How did that get there? Who put that there? I wouldn't be surprised if you could find some archeological evidence of humans hanging out around the areas. I sent an email and photos attached to Montana geologist Dr. Stuart Parker asking him if he'd be willing to do a Zoom interview with me. I quickly received an enthusiastic email back agreeing to do the interview. Hey everybody, I got Stuart Parker here, a geologist from Montana, to talk to us about some of these Montana megaliths. We're going to um, be asking about the Sage Wall, the Tizer Dolmen, and a few other interesting uh, features. Hey, Stuart, how's it going? Good. How are you doing? Doing well. Thanks for being here with us. I was wondering if you could just introduce uh, yourself to the audience today. Talk a little bit about your background, and then we can go ahead and get started after that. We'll go look at some of these features. I put together a little slideshow for us. So, Cool. 
Yeah, I'm Stuart Parker. Um, I recently got my PhD from Idaho State University. I've also gone to school at University of Montana in Missoula. So I primarily study mountain building in the West um, and how mountains are built and how they collapse. Uh, right now I work for the Montana Bureau of Mines and Geology, which is the state survey. And so I make geologic maps like the one you see behind me. I didn't make this one. This is a combination of 50 years of work from many, many people, but I make small geologic maps from all around the state. So anyway, I spend a lot of time just covering every square inch I can outside, um, stumbling across lots of interesting things and trying to sort of make sense of how geology works and how Montana came to be. So it's my background. Awesome. But you haven't stumbled across the sage wall and the Tizer Dolman yet. Is that correct? No, you know, I haven't. And when you showed me, I've, I've never even heard of them. And, you know, my friends here, you know, we're, we're outside every day, every weekend, and we explore these mountains a lot. So I've never actually heard of these. So I was surprised to see them. Um, but the second you showed me these pictures, I knew exactly where they were. They're right in my backyard. And I go climbing out there a lot of times and I see things like this all the time. But these are certainly like the most impressive examples I've seen, but I've seen less impressive examples often so it's really cool to see and what is that place you you said you knew exactly the place they were what did, what did you refer that to it was some type of field correct yeah so it's called the boulder bath lift and so a bath lift is just a lot of plutons so they're magmas that cooled deep within the earth and formed granite and so around the butte montana area where i live um there's a large bath lift called the boulder bath lift and the boulder bath lift um, produces a lot of these boulders that are stacked on top of each other. Um, and so when you when you walk around the woods, uh, a lot of people climb there. I climb there. When you walk around, you see these things all over the place. Um, so so anyway, by looking at the rock and looking at the joints, the cracks in the rock and how they weather um, it, I, I knew right away that it was it was right in my backyard. So. Awesome. And just looking at this, by the way, this is the Tizer Dolman right here. This was one of my favorite sites that I went to. I mean, you just walk up upon this thing and you're just gazing at it and your first question, and I'm sure anybody else's question over thousands of years has been, whoa, how did that get up there? Did someone put that up there? I mean, and I'm hope, and I we're going to try to get um, some natural explanations from you in a moment. You've done a great job of giving me some really nice visuals where we can uh, take a look at how this might have happened naturally. But I just am wondering, Dr. Parker, can you understand when looking at these, especially the sage wall compared to places like Soxe Oman in Peru or some of the other megaliths that you see out there in Peru, can you understand why there are some questions as to how this became uh, compared to some of those megalithic sites that are out there around the world? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think a lot of times whenever people see geometry and sort of symmetry and balancing things, it just seems so unnatural. And so I think a lot of times when people see order in nature, they think it must be created by humans. Whereas from my perspective, being a geologist and from walking around all the time, whenever I look at the landscape, I see the order all the time. I've been trained to look for it. And so it pops out to me right away. Like when you break rocks, they, they produce a remarkable amount of order of systematic patterns. Um, so the way that stress uh, interacts with rocks, the way that rocks break, um, everything, the way that, you know, biological organisms form their structures, there's a lot of order in nature. Um, and so, so anyway, I think, I think for, for people that don't spend a lot of time outdoors, uh, their only association with order is in sort of man-made settings. But to me, I see a lot of order in nature. And then it only seems natural that by seeing all that order in nature, you want to recreate it, um, so from my perspective, it seems like a very natural thing and something I see all the time. So it doesn't particularly stand out to me as something that is the hallmark of humans. Got you. Awesome. Well, and then with that question, I'll just go ahead and ask you, looking at these, um, the two big questions here, and we have some other questions as well. Is it at all possible 
when you look at something like the Tizer Dolmen or some of these other structures or the Sage Wall in particular, that this was created or came to be with some type of human intervention. And if not, do you have some type of natural explanation for it? And I have the drawings that you sent me uh, via email. And so I just, those two questions right there, is it possible that humans were involved in any of this? And if not, what would be the natural, uh, the natural explanation? Yeah, you know, it's certainly possible, you know, as, as scientists, we sort of, our job is to hedge bets. And so usually, you know, anything is possible. It's just a matter of which is more likely. So we think a lot of probabilities, not, you know, yes, no, did this happen this way? Um, and so we try to refute things. And so if I, I would, to me, not knowing much about anthropology and sort of how these structures were built, um, to, to me, a simple geologic explanation has a lot of weight. And so I certainly think it's possible um, that they were built by humans, but I don't see it as being necessary because from what I've seen in the rock record um, and wandering around outside, uh, there's a simple explanation for how these came to be. So it's certainly possible, but not the easiest explanation. So not one that I give much weight. And I have these drawings here. Maybe you could just walk us through it because we have five drawings here that you sent me and you gave a good explanation for each. And maybe you can just tell me to go to the next slide when you're ready. But if in particular, I think that these were for the Tizer Dolman, how it might have came to be that those two split slabs of rock are standing there balanced with what has been referred to as a large capstone or boulder resting almost perfectly on top of it um yeah so the first thing the first thing to keep in mind about the boulder bath lift and about about how rocks come to be at the surface is um these rocks were originally emplaced very deep miles deep and so they were not uplifted but you can think of the ground surface they were initially deep you can think of the overburden being removed so what we're looking at now is the exhumed core of what was once deep within the earth. So in geology, we call this exhumation. And so a lot of people, it's intuitive to think of, you know, mountains going from low places to high places. But another way to get rocks to the surface is by basically lowering the land surface and exhuming the rocks that are at depth. And so that exhumation has definitely happened here over the past 50, 60 million years. Um, there are several, several observations and data sets that we can get to sort of get at this. Um, so we know that's occurred. So that's the first fundamental thing. The second fundamental thing is about the geometry. And so when you exhume rocks like that, you can imagine if you've been sitting, if you've ever been scuba diving or if you've been at the bottom of the pool and you can feel the pressure of the water all around you sort of confining your lungs. When you come to the top, you can feel that release of pressure. The same thing happens when ro with rocks. So when they're at depth, there's a lot of confining pressure about by the rocks above and sort of to the sides of it. When we exhume and remove that material, there's a release of pressure. So the rocks expand. And when they expand, they create these joints. And so joint sets are typically in sort of these orthogonal sets. So there's usually a flat one and then two vertical ones that are like square with each other. Um, and so it's kind of similar to if you bake bread and you have a round loaf, as it expands, it cracks often in pretty systematic checkerboard patterns on top. So that's more or less what's happening with these joint sets is as you exhume these rocks, the pressure is relieved, they expand slightly, and they create these systematic joints to accommodate that expansion. And so in this photo here, you can see the dashed line on top is where the old land surface used to be. And as you're eroding that material, you start jointing the rocks. Um, and with time, you know, water can get into these joints and it basically takes advantage of these and starts weathering the rock. So we initially have this broken checkerboard pattern of rock. Slowly they weather and these blocks become more round. Um, if you go to the next slide, Can you see that? I would think I went to the next one right here. Yeah, there we go. The third, that's perfect. Um, so as 
as we sort of remove more overburden, weather more along these joints, the blocks start becoming more isolated in sort of towers. The old rocks on top become smaller and smaller. Eventually, you know, they're higher related to the to the to the surface, to the land surface. Um, as they weather, they get weaker. So you're kind of like eroding the foundation as you lower the land surface and create relief. So things tend to topple over and fall down. And an important thing about the shape is these start off as blocky joints. And if you imagine a block of ice outside, when you melt the ice, it slowly becomes rounded. So these rocks start off blocky and as they weather more, they become rounded. As they become more rounded, they become more unstable and they tend to topple and tip over. And so if you go to the next slide, okay. this process just continues. And then eventually as sort of the neighbors topple over, you get some towers. So these are the last remaining sort of ones standing up in high relief relative to everything else. Uh, oftentimes you get these precariously balanced boulders on top of those. And so those boulders are basically leftovers of what used to be on top and has everywhere else fallen over, but they remain sort of perched up there. And so on the last slide here, you can see in very rare cases, um, you get these remarkably precarious sort of sort of rocks. They might tip over and be left on top of the last remaining towers. And so this is probably what, what sort of is at place here. Um, so, so think not of how do we get these things up, but think how do we remove everything else to get this tower standing here? Interesting. So you mentioned in your email, one of the things that you were just most fascinated about this site was this is literally like a, um, a photograph of a very rare moment in time. This won't always be, this will eventually fall. Is that correct? Yeah, definitely. And so you can see in the rest of the photo, all of the boulders littering the ground. Um, they're all stacked up on top of each other. A lot of times from the orientations of these joints within the rocks, because they are so systematic, you can look at rocks and see where they used to be. You can find examples of rocks that used to be upright and tipped over. You can see where they rolled from. And by looking at different examples of sort of different snapshots at different times in the toppling process, you can put together a picture of how this progressed through time. Even though we can't see the whole thing in action, it happens over thousands and tens of thousands of years. But by looking at these little snapshots, we can get a picture of what happened to produce this. And so this is just the magic snapshot in time. So this is the Jenga right before it falls. Um, and so we just happen to be looking at it in this particular spot. And you expressed some enthusiasm about the Tizer Dolman and also another, and we're calling them Dolmans just kind of as a nickname right now, um, just because that's kind of what they look like. Also, this one right here, which I believe is at a place called the Giants Playground. Uh, interesting enough, this one, I believe, is pointing north. Uh, someone needs to go out there and verify that. But you expressed some interest. This could help give you some information about earthquakes in the area. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, this is this is really interesting. So for I don't know how long people have been doing this, but for a long time, for decades at least, uh, geologists have been using these features and they call them precariously balanced boulders. And so they've been using these things as a sense to, to give a sense of what the earthquake hazard is in the area. And so the thought being, if you have a very precarious boulder balancing the location, uh, there's a certain amount of shaking that will topple that. So if we're seeing these things in the landscape and they're still standing, then however old they are, we know that there hasn't been a major earthquake in that long. So some of my colleagues here at the Bureau have actually been looking for these features in the Butte area to get a sense of how active the faults are in our town. And so this feature is a perfect, perfect example where if we knew the age of this rock, um, which we can find out, then we would have a sense of sort of how how the earthquake history is over that time period. Um, so so anyway, these are these are very good sort of indicators uh, that there hasn't been a major earthquake recently. Otherwise, they would have tipped over. Awesome. Thanks for that explanation. That's fascinating. So hopefully, um, at the very least, you know, a lot of this enthusiasm will uh, lead to some 
more research in that department right there in regard to earthquakes. Okay. This next topic I want to talk to you about is really interesting. This is, and we kind of talked about this a little bit. Have you ever heard of the stone, the megalithic stone nub theories before um, or aware of the stone? Yeah. Nubs? You know, I, I never have. And when you showed me these pictures, it was like totally remarkable. And I can, I have seen things very similar to this while I've been rock climbing and while I've been in the field. And so um, I, you know, I even have sketches in my notebooks when I was, when I was teaching a, a field course about eight years ago, um, I found similar little nubs on boulders and I was really interested in how they formed. And over the course of the summer, I was able to figure it out, I think. Um, and so, so anyway, these are really similar to some features that I've seen, but what is striking about them is how systematic they are. You know, they're always two on a block, one or two. There's never more, it seems like. Um, they're always right by the edges. They're none in the middle. Um, and so it's really, really interesting. Just, and I have no idea what these could be for. It's fascinating, but it's, yeah, it really took me by surprise. And That's one of the cool. reasons I'm bringing this up is because at the Tizer Dolman in particular, a guy named Michael Collins of Wandering Wolf Productions, when he was out there and he brought a lot of attention, he wasn't the first one that had found this area, but he brought a lot of attention to it. Uh, and one of his videos where he does a walkthrough, he finds these three nubs that are interestingly aligned with each other. And I'd actually just like to show you a video real quick, if you don't mind, that really shows the depth of these. And here's me at the site using my hands just to kind of guide you and show you uh, the depth of these. And the question I'm going to be asking you, because I saw more of these at the sage wall as well, is are there any natural reasons that this might have taken place? It's the same question, really. And are there any possibilities that these could have been man-made? If not, what's, what's the natural explanation for these nubs that you can find here at the Tizer Dolman and the sage wall in Montana? Yeah, so these... Any rock climber, anybody who's climbed on granite, anybody who's climbed on desert sandstone um, will be very familiar with these features. A lot of the best routes, the favorite routes, sort of link these things up, big faces. Um, and so anyway, a lot, of, a lot of routes in the area come to mind when I see these things and I can remember particular holds that are exactly like this. And so there are two sorts of ways that these things can happen. And so... To compare them with the with the nubs you showed on the on the rocks um, in the blocks. So in that case, there's no composition difference. Um, they've been chipped out in relief, it looks like, but there's no composition difference. So you can see in the man-made example um, with those blocks. Yeah, so you can see the rock looks the same. It's not a different color. It's um, it's, it's not a different grain size, not a different composition. Uh, whenever I've seen the, so there are two types of these, these other nubs that, that you showed in the video. Um, so a lot of times they will have a different composition. They'll be darker. Um, they'll be a lot harder, more resistant to weathering, which is why they form sort of these relief, these knobs. So what happens is the rest of the rock erodes more quickly than those resistant knobs. And so they stick around and eventually form this sort of ball shape on um, the sort of knob. And so that's one way that they form is by having sort of a more resistant composition than the surrounding rock. So everything else weathers away more rapidly and it leaves behind this slowly like eroding like sort of ball. And so a way you can think about this is like if you had, if you had sort of a, um, like if you had something in an ice cube that didn't melt, let's say you have a cherry in an ice cube, as you melt the ice cube, it's it will gradually sort of go around the shape and leave the, the harder thing on the surface until it falls out eventually. Um, so that's one way to do it. Another way to do it, uh, which is a little bit harder to grasp, but so if we do have a xenolith, sorry, these things are called xenoliths or mafic enclaves, um, they're common in granite rocks. Um, 
But anyway, if we do have one, if you imagine there's this this resistant class, if you will, this resist more resistant round rock within a granite rock, and the surface of the rock is here. So if you imagine it slowly erodes away the surface, eventually you'll get this really precarious dimple on the edge. And eventually you'll get enough weathering that it totally breaks apart. And when it breaks apart, a lot of times it'll leave a little attachment, a place where it was attached. That's just like a subtle, subtle little, um, little, it's, it's kind of like a little ramp that then ends. So it's sort of like a little mound, a little cone shape. And so if you look at the rock, if the composition is all the same, if there's no difference in grain size, a lot of times it'll have that cone shape and that's where one of these class used to be attached. Um, other times, if you see a different composition, a different grain size, if it's darker in color, if it's more orange in color, something like that, um, then that might be sort of a heterogeneity in the rock, just something that is, you know, different composition that didn't weather. Would this be an example of that cone shape right here by chance? I don't know. Yeah, I think so. It, it looks like it. So you can see the rock looks the same sort of on both sides, um, but it sort of goes to a point. Yeah, it looks more conical to me than sort of sphere shaped. Um, so there's probably a, a mafic enclave, a xenolith attached to that um, that has since fallen apart. And a lot of times when I've seen these things, the what what really convinced me that 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 is what was happening was I would find these on boulders and then I would look on the ground and I would find the one that was attached to it. It just fell over. Um, so sometimes you can find that, uh, but there, this is the way that granite rocks weather It's called spheroidal weathering. And so it's the same concept. If you have a block of ice and you let it sit in the sun, it'll get rounder with time. And so it's just a, a common thing you see in um, very homogeneous rocks that have that aren't layered um, like granite is not layered um, when they erode they tend to get these round shapes um, so this is a type of spheroidal weathering I think so before we get to the sage wall I have one more question about these because I do want to talk about the sage wall in particular just to kind of summarize could you also maybe talk about why or some theories that you and I had talked about before this as to how some of these alignments could happen? I mean, here you have three nubs that seem to be in a line with each other. Are there any theories out there as to how that could happen in nature versus, you know, potentially, you know, for, for someone like me, when I first saw this, I'm not going to lie, I did think wow, that looks like it was man-made, like there was something intentional about it. Is there any way that nature can produce something like this with these three nubs all in a line with some order to it? Mm -hmm. Certainly. And so if you, if you imagine just, so these mafic enclaves that I was talking about, they're just darker, more resistant rocks that are caught up within the granite and they're just randomly distributed. Um, so if you can imagine just random round things distributed in space, there's actually a pretty high likelihood that three of them will form a line. And so there was a philosopher uh, way back in the day, I think in the 17th century, and he had this philosophical question that was basically, if you have a wood slat floor with boards, and you drop matches at random, what's the likelihood that they will cross the slats on the wood board? And so it's it's a pattern of matches crossing, intersecting wood boards that arises with some chance from random randomness. And so you can actually calculate the probability um, by looking at the parameters, things like the spacing of the slats in the board, the length of the matches. So you could do similar things with these class. You can sort of look at their size, look at how perfectly they are in a line, the number of them, and you can sort of get a sense of from random distributions, what's the probability that this pattern would arise? And for three points in a line, it's actually pretty high. You're actually pretty likely to get. Now, if there were six points in a line, that is much, much uh, less likely to happen by chance. And so 
So playing these probability games is really a way to sort of convince yourself of what's common and what's uncommon. But, you know, as humans, we're trained to see patterns. So naturally, we're going to we're going to see these patterns. OK, good. Thanks for that explanation there. And let's talk about the stage wall. You gave a really good explanation for the Tizer Dolman. I'm wondering if there's a similar explanation that you would be giving for the stage wall, if there's something different about it, or if there's, you know, anything that strikes you when I, with these pictures I've sent to you that is peculiar, enigmatic or unexplained. Is there anything natural going on here that you could give us an explanation for? Let me go up to the picture right here to the left is the stage yeah. wall. So just just contrasting the two so in the sage wall example you can see there's more or less two really prominent fracture sets joints so there's the horizontal set and then there's the vertical set and you can see that for almost every one of these they're straight and they basically connect multiple blocks so if you follow one of these joints you'll have many many blocks on either side of it in the Peru example, however, if you follow one of the cracks, you'll see that they step often. So they're not just straight with blocks sort of stacked on. So they're not like simply bricks, but they're nested into each other. And so that, that's a very, to me, to my eye, seeing these just, you know, quickly, that's, that's a main difference between the Montana example and the Peru example. In the Montana example, um, all of the fractures are sort of through going, forming long linear lines. Whereas in the Peru example, they stair step in these right corners. Where we see branching in the Montana example, um, most of the times they're sort of, uh, they we get lots of T intersections, uh, which I don't see as many of in the Peru example. In the Peru example, a lot of times you get four points coming together. Um, in the Montana example, they get a lot of these T intersections. Uh, so anyway, to my eye, these, uh, these are very common in joint sets. And so in the Boulder bath lift, these joints have a regional pattern. And so a lot of times when we climb, we're climbing up these joints. And a lot of times we're climbing these really wafer thin little towers that are really long in a north south direction. Um, and that's because the joint sets are closely spaced going north south and they're wider spaced going east west typically. Um, so when they weather, you tend to get these long sort of uh, these long linear fins and things like that. Um, so, so to my eye, it looks it looks similar to a lot of the other weathering features I've seen in the area, where you just have these sort of long wafers, and when everything around them weathers, they leave sort of a broken wall looking thing. And so, one thing you could, another thing from looking at these photos. Um, so, in the lower right of the Montana photo you can see there are little rocks on the ground that are the same composition as in the wall. Um, so the bedrock nearby is the same as the rocks constructed in the walls. If you're there, you can see boulders all over the place. So the difference between the Montana wall and, or the sage wall and the, um, the rocks in the ground is just that the sage wall is in relief and ordered. In the Peru example, you can see how manicured it is. You can see that there aren't boulders all over the place. All of the boulders in the area are concentrated in one spot. Um, so that's another thing that that jumps out to me. In all of these examples I've seen in Montana, there are boulders everywhere, where when I think of sort of the constructed sites that I've seen, typically the rocks are exotic and all the rocks in the area have been scoured and put into one place. And in your email that you sent to me, I'm just going to quote you real quick. You wrote, of course, I'm a geologist, not an anthropologist, so I could be wrong. I'd be convinced otherwise if I saw some significant evidence of human interference. Both hypotheses are testable by non-destructive means. For instance, I predict that in both features, you should see instances where through-going features cut across neighboring blocks, indicating they formed in place and have not been moved. Veins, dikes, small fractures, and mafic enclaves are examples of through-going features that could demonstrate that the boulders weathered in place. I also predict that the joints are parallel to the regional joint set. In much of the boulder batholith, 
They run north and south. For the sage wool, I predict that the rock forming the wool has a different texture, so grain size, susceptibility to weathering, composition, etc., than the surrounding ground. Neighboring boulders and outcrops should be similarly oriented, even though they may be much less impressive. Uh, could you just kind of explain that? Could you kind of simplify that for us right yeah. there? There's two predictions that you made. Yeah, totally. So what's common in the boulder batholith, um, so there's a large copper deposit here in Butte. That's why the town's here. And there are all sorts of and small dikes, which is just melt that intruded and solidified into a fracture um, that cut this rock. And so we can find these features. They're long planar features. So on surfaces, they're long lines. In 3D, there are these planes where the rock broke. And so a lot of times we can find these. They're very common. So my guess is that if we were to follow the sage wall and walk along it, we would see some of these features and we could see that they would cut adjacent blocks, showing that the blocks were next to each other. There was this feature linking them to, and then the joint came afterwards. And so in geology, this is called the law of cross-cutting relationships. And so when we see things that intersect, we can get a sense of which had to come first and which came later. And this would demonstrate that the rocks were initially in this configuration before they were jointed. So, so that's, that's one thing that I would predict. Um, the part of that and another, sorry, yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. Yeah, no, okay. go for it. So would part of that be like an unfinished fracture? Like you're seeing something that's still going and it's like in a line toward maybe another set of blocks. Cause I, I think there are some, maybe some examples of that out there. Yeah. In a, and a lot of times the the fractures that I'm describing form in different ways. So the fractures that host the ore in the copper in BU, those formed a depth with hot fluid running through them. Whereas these joints formed at the surface when the rock is cold and brittle and it basically cracks. Um, and so a lot of these, by looking at the older fractures that were formed from hot fluids that are relics of a time when the rocks were deeply buried. Um, we know those are the older features, so we can compare those to how they interact with the younger joints um, to establish continuity. So, wow. and and what you, you know, the, as, a, as a geologist, my job is to map. And so the first thing we do to sort of understand the world, no matter what you're doing, no matter what you're interested, anything related to geology, um, you just start by making a map. And so if I were to map this area, it's something you could do without harming the rock, without chipping anything, without destroying anything, simply by looking and measuring. Um, you can measure the orientation of things. You can map out all of these sort of blocks. You can look at their dimensions. And so my, my hunch is that if you were to map out these features, um, you would see a lot of similarities in orientations and sizes between the sage wall and all of the adjacent rocks. Um, so the unique thing about the sage wall would be that it its dimensions, it's still standing, it hasn't toppled over. But I imagine that you could trace it out and find places where it has sort of toppled over and find neighbors that look similar but have fallen apart. So that's, that's my hunch. But In that email, you'd mentioned that, you know, for you to change your mind, you need to see some significant evidence of human intervention. And at a lot of the megalithic sites around the world, there is um, human intervention on areas that were already natural. So already a natural um, anomaly or a large um, boulder that was already there and the humans intervene on it and manipulate it to their advantage. What would you need to see at a site like the Tizer Dolman and the Sage Wall in Montana to have any of that evidence that you uh, talked about needing in that email. Yeah, so I mean, I'm not an anthropologist, I'm a geologist. So honestly, I don't quite know what I'm looking for. So I think I'm open-minded, but if I was just out there by myself as a geologist, I would have to see, first of all, something that I couldn't explain with geology, something that I've never seen before, that I've never seen in the natural world. Um, and if I heard a compelling argument 
that explain something that I couldn't explain with geology, then I could be convinced. Um, but, but yeah, so that's, so I don't quite know, you know, it's, it's, I don't quite know what would convince me. Um, I'm not looking for a particular silver bullet in mind because I don't know anthropology. So what I would need personally is a simpler explanation for something that I can't explain myself. Um, and as far as these features I've seen, um, I can explain them. They're very similar to other things I've seen. So I don't need to call on, call on an elegant solution. But, but if, a, if someone presented me with an argument and showed me some evidence uh, that was remarkable, I would certainly change my tune. But there's a, there's a quote by Carl Sagan that I like. And so he was, you know, famous scientist who was looking for extraterrestrial life. And so he's a pretty open-minded individual. Um, and he said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And so, you know, claim that structures like this are man-made is pretty extraordinary. So they require a large amount of evidence, not just, you know, some happenstance. Awesome. And is it fair to say that um, you're interested in visiting the Sage Wall and the Tizer Dolman and the uh, Giants Playground area uh, for maybe even future research? Uh... Yeah, totally. I mean, to me, uh, if these features aren't man-made, it doesn't make them any less impressive. I mean, personally, it makes them more impressive to think that we can have such precarious structures with such order that are so you know in such relief that just came to be by simply eroding rocks um so so i think i mean i can imagine humans building structures that's ordinary but what's extraordinary to me is finding something just balanced perfectly in the woods that'll fall any day but hasn't yet um so, so I think this is incredible because this is something caught in the act. That's a one in the million uh, related to just natural processes, but we just happen to be lucky enough to see it. I really enjoyed the interview with Dr. Parker. It's my hope that this hasn't spoiled any fun for anyone that's had enthusiasm about the sites. I'm sure there's going to be rebuttals online to Dr. Parker's initial analysis. And in the name of being open-minded, I look forward to hearing them. Dr. Parker followed up the interview asking for coordinates to one of the sites because he believed it was almost a perfect tool to measure the history of earthquakes in the area. If anything, the enthusiasm revolving around these sites might lead to new scientific discoveries and knowledge about the area's geological past. <laughs> That's good. So in other words, you're, you wouldn't be heartbroken or upset if the in conclusion did conclude that, hey, these appear to be natural. No, I mean, you know... You know, I think it'd be amazing if, if this was a, a megalithic wall. Um, it it would change the entire narrative of our history um, and and the world and 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 how things are approached with um, when it comes to to ancient history and um, archaeology. Um, but again, like we talked about at the beginning of uh, starting here today. It's the process, I think, that's important. It's just as important as the answer. It's the process of going through and asking questions, inspiring other people. I've, look, since I released this video last year, I've been contacted by so many people, you know, um, that never knew about this site, that live in that area, and um, have gone to visit it and and gone to see something. And, you know... I, I know you'll agree with me when you walk up to this site, regardless of what it is, you're blown away um, standing in its presence. It's massive. It's incredible to look at. I've seen incredible natural formations and incredible me megalithic structures all over the world. And, and, and they're both just as uh, incredible when you're in the moment standing in front of them. But you know, the, 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 the important here thing, the important thing here is, is that we're asking the questions, that we're going through the process of of exploration, um, bringing it to other people's attention. There's so many people. I, I'm getting pictures all the time now. People send me, and I, I encourage people to do this. 
send me pictures, reach out to me because, you know, I, I, there's a group, there's a really good chance that if you find something, I will come out there and visit and, and, and film it. Um, the, you know, but I've gotten people sending me pictures from all over the country now from, um, things that they, they're, they're like, do you think, do you think this could be, I, I think it's great that you're thinking, you know, and that you're asking questions and that you're contacting me and sending me stuff. That's amazing. Let's keep looking um, collectively together. Let's all contribute to this. Um, you know, that's how things are found. Not by just saying, oh, they've already done the work. You, you know, they've already done the work and labeled the whole area of Athlith and there's explanations for all of it and, and, and stuff. And that's great. But, you know, there's, there's a million other benefits to, to, uh, to, to continuing to ask these questions. There's the possibility of making new discoveries. There's possibilities of just finding something like you mentioned, campfires, arrowheads, and understanding more about a culture that possibly just lived in the area, even if it is a natural formation. There's people that are getting up and going out and doing things and looking and hiking and exploring now for knowing that this exists. Um, and, and that's good. That's good stuff, you know, regardless of whether it's natural or man-made. Now, clearly, it's way more exciting if this is an, a man-made structure. It's a whole, that's a whole, that's a whole, like, you know, trip that I think we all want to go on, right? Um, uh, but I, I think that the, the, the process of just asking the questions and exploring is just as, just as good. Um, and 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 beneficial for for people and relationships individually and and uh, exploring ideas and taking that and applying it to other things too. So, what do you all think? Did Dr. Parker's initial analysis provide you with an adequate explanation as to why these sites develop naturally, or do you believe that human intervention was involved in some type of way? This episode was the first chapter in my book, Enigmatic North America, Legends, Oddities, and Controversial History. I spent three years traveling around the U.S. and Mexico in search of answers to some of the more burning curiosities I had about its incredible and often bizarre history. It's available in both paperback and ebook. For those that would like to support the channel, the paperback would be a fun coffee table style book for any visiting open-minded friends or family to enjoy. The ebook is listed at a more affordable price range for those who maybe can't quite afford the paperback but would still like to support the channel. Her view on Amazon would be greatly appreciated. Next episode, we are diving deep into Chapter 2, The Mystery of the Western Message Petroglyphs. At 39 sites across 8 states, you can find these bizarre rock carvings which feature symbology from all over the world. Egyptian, Mayan, Asian, Native American hand gestures, and even fraternal order or secret society symbols. These things aren't exactly brand new either. In this episode, we take a look at the research and evidence in an attempt to find out when these were created and for what purpose. Stay tuned for the mystery of the Western Message Petroglyphs, and thank you all so much for taking the time to watch my videos. I really appreciate it. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, subscribe, and share with someone you think might find this interesting. Until next time, take care.